Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the third panel of the day of the 30th anniversary Euro Money Global Borrowers and Bond Investors Forum. Uh, and the topic at hand for this panel uh, is the future of the city, future of the city post Brexit. Um, and to talk about that, we've assembled a panel of five people who I'm going to introduce with extreme brevity um, in alphabetical order. Charlie Berman, uh, it's a chief executive and co founder of Agora Digital Capital Markets. You can tell he's the digital one because he's got his shirt open. Um, the next panelist in alphabetical order uh, is Jerome Booth, who was a very famous man at Ashmore, one of the founders and ultimate sellers of Ashmore, and is now an independent economist and, and writer, author. Um, David Katimbo is senior fund manager at Eden Tree Investment Management, uh, where he specializes in sterling. That's why we've asked him to this. Um, Sheree Coley is the head of debt capital markets at the London Stock Exchange. Um, and Jeremy Smuha is the chief executive officer of Atlantic Omnium, which you can see pictured behind him on the side as though he were in Geneva, but I don't think he is in Geneva, really. <laughs> so um, we're going to start with, you know, just a pretty ordinary question, but I'd like you essentially each to give a sort of long or short view on the city of London. So the way I'm phrasing this is, will the city miss the EU? Or will the EU miss the city? So we may as well stay in that order and, and start with you, Charlie. Well, Chris, I'm going to I'm going to give an answer, which is you know you you might be disappointed with, which is in the sense that I think this is one of those relationships that's broken down, and both will miss each other, but can't actually live with each other anymore. But I think we we both have um, lost something. Um, but probably have things to gain as well. So as it relates to your specific um, question, um, I, I think it's, it, it, it runs both ways. Um, and uh, clearly uh, the EU will have lost um, one of the largest economies in the world. And whilst we're very fond of being very self-deprecating in Britain, um, we are one of the largest economies in the world. Um, and that's no small matter for a for 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 um, uh, the, the EU. Uh, equally, uh, the UK um, has moved out of something which has become embedded um, uh, uh, in our, our business um, uh, for the last forty years, uh, and it's going to be complicated for a period of time. Anybody um, who expected it to be anything else um, is 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 is. So somewhat foolish um, and, and probably rather ignorant. Um, so we just have to get on with deal with it. Um, uh, I'm personally very optimistic uh, as it relates to financial services. London remains a huge global centre. Um, and in relation to uh, what uh, the particular uh, things that I'm doing, uh, which are now um, not so much front uh, coalface um, capital markets, but um, the technology behind it, um, the City of London is a is a massive leader in financial services. So um, I'm optimistic. Okay, I should have mentioned in, in the in, in thing, sorry in things digital, um, not just financial services. Okay, well you keep your fingers to yourself, Charlie. But um, I should have mentioned in the introduction, of course, that Charlie is uh, was for donkey's years an extremely important man in DCM um, at Salomons and then various other places. Um, Jerome, are you long or short the City of London? Oh, well, um, I'm, I'm optimistic, and I wouldn't disagree with anything uh, uh, Charlie just said. I, I would add, though, that uh, the time frame, um, you know, does vary. And personally, you know, I'm, I'm uh, optimistic that we, uh, the city, can uh, really look now to the global markets and expand in ways that might not have been otherwise possible. I also think um, that the Eurozone is not at all static. We have to remember that um, you know there is a thing called op optimal currency theory, and even before the euro started, it was pretty clear that um, it, there is no optimal currency zone uh, uh, where the euro is, and that of course either needs to change or the euro will not exist forever. And for that to change requires a fiscal union for which there is currently still no uh, political uh, uh, legitimacy. Um, so. I think things very much in flux, and I think it may well be that uh, the short answer is that uh, the euro may miss us a lot more than the other way around. Okay, uh, you've raised a number of 
very large themes there, some of which we'll come back to in a moment. But David, sticking with our alphabetical order just for a moment, we won't continue this way. But David, uh, are you long or short the city of London? Will they miss us? Will we miss them? Um, I'm certainly long um, insofar as I'm concerned, of course, as a Sterling Fixed Invest Fund Manager, I sort of have very um, few other options. But I would say in terms of how things have panned out, the warnings that we saw um, pre, of course, the sort of exit itself, um, th there's very little that has come to pass that sort of worries me about our stance going forward. And some interesting points just raised there about the independence to charter um, your own path. I think that is um, a very strong advantage that the city has. Um, you know, if anything, it's still attracting those foreign direct investment flows and um, th there's not been a let up um, on, on the confidence, at least. Um, if you look at the um, the way the UK government have dealt with the pandemic and the success um, thereafter, I think that still puts us in a very strong position as a country, but also um, as a financial services sector, um, I think we have a very strong, robust um, regulatory framework that is still attractive. And so I don't think Brexit has um, changed that really. So I'd, I'd definitely say I'm, I'm long. I wonder if we're going to, if we should. We needed somebody on this panel who was a sort of terrible Brexit pessimist and 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 uh, who would say quite the opposite thing. Because I don't think the London Stock Exchange is going to say that London is finished. But it is fair to note, I think, worth noting that five years ago, almost to the day, um, I was chairing chunks of this conference. Then the twenty fifth iteration, uh, and that was the day before the referendum itself took place. And people were saying then quite confidently that if there was a vote to leave that the city of London would almost empty overnight and the UK economy would crash immediately, even on the back of a vote. Uh, and of course, that didn't happen. Um, but no doubt there are, of course, many, many drawbacks. Um, so, Shrey, the London Stock Exchange, um, obviously you're somewhat bought into the city of London, um, but just expand a little bit on that. How, how, will, how will they miss, how does the London Stock Exchange miss the EU uh, how do they miss it? Well, thanks, Chris. And I hope I had a non-partisan voice over here because I did move to the UK from outside the EU 12 years ago. Uh, but London is home. And one of the things London will remain, as David said, is open, vibrant and competitive. But things will be different. And Charlie noted the sense of the relationship over here. And it's very hard to say whether it's good different or bad different, but it is different. Uh, one of the things that we've had to do, for example, is uh, set up trading authorizations in the EU to offer our trading markets to secondary clients who are based in the EU trading EU shares. That's different. We didn't have to do that, but we have done so to keep markets not fragmented. Uh, our clearing houses have had to have authorizations in the EU and have equivalents till 2022. But some things we can do differently out of choice now as the UK. One of the examples of that is that the FCA has made it easier for global borrowers, the listeners of this conference, to raise debt finance in London by creating an exemption in the UK prospectus rules. And I think this will evolve over time, but as the London Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange Group, our job is to keep the pipes working, the valves working, and ensure that customers get access to markets and the cost to access markets don't ratchet up. Uh, and ultimately, most successful global financial centers are global. Uh, and I think that's where London will continue to stand. Okay, Jeremy, are we getting a diversity of opinion here or? Well, yes, sli a slight diversity. I mean, I, I do sit in London, but our main office is in Geneva. So I do have quite a lot of viewpoint about London from, from outside. And, and one thing I would say is that um, as some of you, so I think it is path, you can't be optimistic or pessimistic. You have to be path dependent. And I think because we're in the financial industry and we service entrepreneurs, we sometimes forget that we ourselves have to be entrepreneurs. And Shreya's just mentioned this. He's had to change his behavior and actually go out and find new markets. And I think this is what's going to be necessary in London. And so, you know, I, I remember someone saying the MSCI EFA or AFA index, everyone thinks, or a lot of people, the younger ones, think that it's Europe, Asia, it's Europe, Australia, and the Far East. And, the fact that London will probably, you say whether it will miss Europe or not, or Europe will miss us, I think London is going to have to look outside to try and expand um, markets which are not European, because I think the Europeans are desperately 
going to want to compete with us and take business away from us. And they will. And they will. And so therefore, it's up to London to go and find other markets. But I would say there's one thing I am optimistic on is, and, and then also sitting between Geneva and London, this is a very important thing, is there is a huge, in both of these areas, a hinterland of support for, uh, for the financial sector. So it's all very well for Mr. Macron to take 20 highly educated Harvard or uh, Cambridge or Polytechnique educated people and put them in Paris. But where are the 25 support people who have to surround them? And you know, I work just near Liverpool Street and the, when, when it's not COVID, the thousands of people who rush in who've had probably generations of training. Certainly in Geneva, you have a wonderful education system, which is provided by the banks of, um, of uh, training from the age of 16. Um, so that by the time, you know, when we're looking for support staff, it's very easy, there's a huge competition for it. Uh, and I think that is that hinterland is going to really help um, help support the, the fintech as well in, in around London. So that that's one advantage we have. But don't don't be kidded that Europe is not going to want to compete very strongly against us and will take business from London. Well, talking about taking business from London, Jeremy, I'm going to stick with you because one very material thing, which is often talked about, um, is uh, is Euro clearing. Uh, and the, the desire, the wish, the, the intention that that should be moved out of London. That, of course, is a question which predates Brexit by some long time. And the, the question of why should uh, euro transactions be settled outside the euro currency zone uh, was a live question from the birth of the euro. But will, will that happen? I mean, will, will euro clearing leave London? Um, in your view, Jeremy, we'll just have a very quick question on this a session on this. Nobody, everybody doesn't need to answer. But Jeremy, what do you think? Uh, I think they'll probably want to keep some in London because they just want to keep the volumes high. And if they take it away from London, well, you know, they're just cutting off their nose to spite their face. But that's my. Well, they, they have. They, it's possible to cut off their nose and spite their, to spite their faces, isn't it? Jeremy, what do you think? Oh, I think I think irrespective of this particular example, I think there's going to be quite a bit of that. I mean, I think, um, you know, we talk about the need to, Jeremy was talking about the need to expand, and I, I welcome that. I'm an emerging markets hand, as, as you are, Chris. And, and you know, we naturally need to uh, embrace the part of the world that's growing and is most productive, uh, product, uh, you know, growing productivity. And um, I think Europe increasingly has been inward looking, and I think it will continue to be inward looking. And we need to be outward looking. And I think this also refers, I mean, a shake up is no bad thing in lots of ways if we if we can take advantage of it. This also applies to uh, lack of competition. We have um, a number of very large firms. Uh, oligopolistic competition is a problem. And I think, you know, we've seen this um, in the economy at large in the whole Brexit debate. You know, large companies, uh, including large financial institutions, do have... Uh, an intrinsic interest in keeping the status quo. Upcoming competitive, often more entrepreneurial firms actually want to want to shake it up a bit and can benefit from uh, new arrangements. So um, I think we need to be very, uh, uh, with all, I don't disagree with anything that anybody else has said, and we've got to be entrepreneurial, we've got to build on that, and we've got to be outward looking. I think it's, um, if there's a risk of protectionism, it's in the European, you know, the, 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 the remainder of the European Union. It's, it shouldn't come from us as well. We've got no need for it. And let's hope that that doesn't happen. Does anybody else want to come in on this specific point, David or Shrey? Shrey? Yes, Chris. I mean, as, as the financial market infrastructure in the room, I think it's, it's, it's important to talk about this. But the Euros are on and the easiest football analogy right now is, you know, you don't want Europe to score an own goal. Uh, and you have to hear what European investors say about Euro clearing, which is the cost of fragmenting a single pool where you get access to risk manage and net your, um, your positions and hedge your risks uh, means that net net at the end of the result, you know, who's going to lose? It's, 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 it's investors. Uh, and the euro, as sterling, as dollar, is a global currency. I mean, uh, an international borrower who is issuing in euro, sitting in New York, trading to a bank in New York, needs to hedge its euro-denominated risk in some form or the other. So I think the real question over here is, 
is the global ambitions of the financial center. And we, look, we certainly think it's important for financial centers to be global, whether it be London, whether it be Frankfurt, whether it be Paris, Hong Kong, Singapore, or New York. Okay, does anybody else want to join on that? Stick your hand up if you do. I'll start talking. Three, two, one. No, yeah, no. I'd, I'd echo what um, um, what's just been said by Shui and, and certainly a few others. As a global venue, I mean, it's it's hard to believe that you know the infrastructure there, the capacity, the efficiency, um, is is something um, sort of you can ignore in where you want to. Um, position that that central clearing geographically i mean let's let's not sort of forget um there's a lot of political um aspects here that um are maybe overriding that that sure. decision but from an efficiency point of view i mean i think london as a global venue will stay um quite quite close to the action yes some might be fragmented but um you know for the investors and the costs of doing that I think it's it's much better um, that that we sort of keep that yeah. um, to well, ourselves, question, though, if not on the show. Not much loading up a whole load of cost if you don't need to. I don't know if any of you saw the opening session this morning, which was an interview done by my friend Victoria Ben with the utterly brilliant Blythe Masters, whom you will all remember from various things she's done. But she made the point that in, it's in it's in clearing and settlement that the next blow up is likely to occur. And of course, she's an, an advocate for um, uh, distributed ledger technology. Um, blockchain, and she is saying that uh, blockchain effectively reduces settlement to T plus one second, um, and uh, the collateral that's necessary in the settlement process um, will be removed from the equation. Uh, anyway, you can watch that. It's recorded. You can watch it afterwards. I, I do commend it to you, I must say. Um, Charlie, I'm going to, I, you want to answer that question. I'm not going to let you. I'm going to ask you a different question, uh, which we'll talk about. Everybody will get a chance to talk about. Um, the FCA uh, has the thing which is, which is called the uh, TPR, Temporary Permissions Regime. And there's another version of it specifically for funds called the TMPR, Temporary Marketing Permissions Regime, which basically just continues passporting for EU firms into the city of London so they can operate in the UK. Um, how's the uh, EU reciprocating on that, so far, quite comfortable relationship for its own firms? Um, uh, sorry, Chris, I, I, I didn't catch half your question there. Um, but, 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 uh, but passporting yes. is the topic. We, this country, the UK, the City of London, essentially has allowed passporting to continue through a thing called the temporary permission yes. regime. Is that, might that be reciprocated on the other side of the trade? <laughs> one, would, one, would, one would hope so. One would hope a degree of uh, pragmatism um, stretches in. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not so close to this, this these days because I'm not within one of the large banks. I, I am aware that um, in, in relation to uh, uh, former colleagues and competitors, um, this is th their efforts to, or, or not just their efforts, they are having to move people around, uh, modest numbers, but they are having to move people around. And the European regulators are quite serious about having the right people in the right locations according to what they want to see. Um, I don't think ultimately this is, um, in the interests of of anyone, really, um, because it's trying to force. Um, uh, if, if there's any attempt to try and force people or capital into certain slots um, uh, artificially, uh, rather than letting it flow to where it naturally wants to go, um, those are always just big constraints on trade, and nobody's ever a winner. Um, so I, I, I think uh, to date. Um, it, 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 in terms of my new business or the business that's two and a half, three, nearly three years old, um, we haven't been impacted so far uh, by um, these regulations, but we're a, a software provider, we're a technology provider. Um, I think the impact is more significant, uh, whether it is materially significant for many of those firms, I, I, you'd have to ask somebody who's in there, um, uh, I think everybody will say it is, whether it actually is, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Well, from, from the fund management point of view, um, 
we were promised um, many years ago that passporting would be seamless. It's a, it's a terrible. I mean, there is so much protectionism when you're trying to sell a fund across a border. It's just unbearable. I, I don't see that there'll be reciprocation. I don't think the French or the Germans or the Italians care very much um, and about by the, way, the funds that we produce. Um, so if that's just a guide of what policy is, then in the debt capital markets, I don't think you'll see much passport. If I, may. Uh, I mean, you know, this is this is not a function of Brexit. You know, we, we have had basically protectionism uh, wherever in lots of different places, in financial markets as well as elsewhere uh, in services, particularly uh, even before Brexit. So, you know, I, I don't think just because something's pragmatic and makes good sense. I mean, one hopes the obvious uh, uh, pragmatic uh, uh, solution will occur. But I'm afraid we're not dealing with um, you know, necessarily a, a rational set of decision makers. We are talking about a political union which is, you know, in flux and which is demonstrated its capacity for a being incompetent at the very highest level and b of actually changing its mind in an unpredictable way which unnerves investors and you know i i really think it's you know we call a spade a spade this is this is a major problem for the european union if it wants to attract uh you know financial sector business away from london and i think we just have to sit here and be patient and do the right thing by investors and continue our uh, uh, outward looking focus and focus on investor interests. Shrey, do you see any possibility that passporting, as it currently stands, which is effectively just as it always was, could be there could be an agreement to reciprocate that so that the some of these problems will go away? So I think it's, it's important to take a step back here and see the bigger picture and in debt capital markets, you know, those markets which are largely wholesale, um, you know, passporting has been of limited of a limited issue. Uh, if you look at, you know, the last uh, books of Germany's green bond, the largest share of investors who were buying the bond were UK investors at 22, 23 uh, percent ahead of investors from Germany. Uh, so I think from a wholesale perspective, you know, the issue of passporting um, to be honest, has been a little bit of a red herring. Um, where it does start mattering is when you access retail markets, right? For, for example, uh, the European banking community accessing UK retail. Uh, and look, UK is still one of the largest centers of asset management in Europe and across the world. Uh, and because of the new set of rules, now you do require to pass what you can't passport your prospectus anymore. You have to get it authorized from the regulator over here in the UK. And this is one thing which was missed in the entire debate there's more inbound passporting of prospectuses and documents from Europe to the UK than it is from the UK to Europe. But look, this is not a zero sum game. I think, you know, what we all care about in financial markets is ensuring that companies get access to capital in as uh, a cost effective manner as possible, keeping in mind what investors risk horizons are. And I think that's our job as financial markets pra practitioners. And in general, if you look at markets three years post, four years, five years post the referendum and one year post or first of January post Brexit, uh, markets have generally worked. So I think that's the pragmatism of now, which is our job as, as, as practitioners, as market infrastructures, as investors, as former bankers. Okay, uh, David, I'm, uh, there's a question from someone in the audience, which I, mm -hmm. I'm going to put to you, it obviously is related to everything else we've been talking about. Um, the question reads, that it's all very well to talk about London having a chance to go its own way, but in reality, it comes down to specific issues of regulation, which of course is what we've just been talking about. What are the points where the UK should diverge from Europe? Do you have a um, view on that? Um, yes, a, a few points. I mean, without sort of wanting to go into the MIFID debate, I think um, there is flex now for London to be able to set its own path. Um, a large constraint, I suppose, in rules themselves in the politics um, side of the equation has been that um, the EU was almost a, what can I say, an obstacle if not a, um, a challenge um, insofar as setting up independent um, rules was concerned. And I think right now what you have is the ability um, to not look over your shoulder, but to set rules um, in a way that you can sort of help your own markets 
grow without worrying too much about what the other um, 28 or 27 um, think about it. And um, with the central bank, for instance, um, you're able um, now to set your QE agenda um, much better, um, climate align it for that matter, um, without worrying too much about um, what the ECB is doing or not doing. But um, I think for the, um, the regulator, the FCA, um, it's, it's that freedom to be able to, um, you know, charter your own regulatory path without um, worrying too much about what's on the continent. And so on MIFID, we should be able to extricate ourselves uh, much quicker. I mean, bearing in mind, of course, we were quite um, at the forefront of setting um, the agenda with regards um, research and unbundling. But um, you're, you're, I guess, more independent to be able to move quicker on that front than having to wait um, for the entire um, continent um, to sort of execute those sorts of decisions, I would say. Okay. Uh, Jerome, you want to comment on that? And I'm yeah, to it's, to Charlie. Like, it's a slight digression, but I, but I, I think the, the issue of, of regulation and how we move forward, um, I, I, I have a particular desire to see us uh, move away from Europe's fascination with particular instruments and regulating, which is something that from time to time they ban particular uh, derivatives or whatever, and there's been certainly a lot of talk about that over the year. So I, I, in my first book, which is a, basically an attack of finance theory uh, on finance theory, um, you know, I'm a, I'm proposing that we really look at mapping, um, uh, you know, who hold, holds what, and also, um, which the certain central banks, including the Bank of England, have started to do, but also the, the sort of world views of the people and the liability structures of whoever is owning them. And in that way, have a much more intelligent regulatory regime, because it's not actually the instrument which which is where systemic risk comes from. It's from the behaviour in the whole of of how people are behaving and, and how those beliefs can shift suddenly, creating you know a, a liquidity shortage uh, and and a, and a sudden change of worldview. All those factors um, could be laying the way uh, for a very different type of regulation, which is much more focused on intelligent observation of who's doing what without uh, uh, compromising people's freedom to do what they want. So I think we could, on one hand, have a, a system which is, if you like, less focused on the details uh, of which instruments in particular are, are looked at, whilst at the same time um, really creating and, and, and creating a freedom to operate, whilst also giving the confidence that we're actually really even more prepared for systemic risk. And I think there has been a fundamental misunderstanding of risk and a misunderstanding of how to um, uh, manage it and how to in particular cope with uh, uh, systemic risk which seems to be a you know it's still not gone away and for all of the claims that the banks are better regulated they are but actually there's still huge leverage elsewhere in the financial system so we still have this problem and i think this is an opportunity for the city to grasp this and come up with a with a new framework and the elements are already there because we the bank of england started to look at mapping uh, individual, so, or when I say individual, individual uh, market uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, participants, what they hold and why they hold it. Okay, thank you, Charlie. A comment, comment on what others have said by all means, but I do want to ask. I want to move the question as well to there is this opportunity which David has mentioned, prompted by the question from the audience, for the City of London to engage in what we might call regulatory arbitrage. Uh, to attract more business, uh, and and that is you know even down to things like bankers' bonuses. You know, I mean, your ex colleagues at Barcap obviously can't be paid as much uh, as they might be paid in New York um, because of EU regulations. That, of course, is the UK is now at liberty to, to change. And um, so, but comment on what Jerome and, and David have said, uh, and and just move on to that point as well, if you would. Right, I'm. I'm I might digress from the question and pick up on something you said earlier on, because when the word regulations um, mentioned, it, it raises a number of um, points in my head. So you talked about Blythe Masters, and and Blythe is obviously one of the uh, one of the first people from the old world, the world that I come from, um, who recognised uh, the uh, the need to address. Uh, problems in our overall infrastructure, the way things get done, um, it, to many people, really boring stuff. You know, how do, how do transactions settle? Um, how long does it take? 
What do people need to do? Who are all the service providers along the whole value chain? Um, and there are many people who think, well, you know, we all understand that. We know how it, it, it works. So it does trillions of dollars every day. Why do we, why do we need to change anything? Well, the, the, the reality is that technologies are coming in which will enable significant changes in the way our system functions. Um, and, uh, and also, it's not just about pain points and solving problems. It's about ushering in very new and very interesting new products and ways of doing business. So if I have a concern when we talk about regulation, the argument is always put about as to uh, um, uh, the, how is London going to break free of the shackles imposed by the EU? I'm going to turn that on its head and say there is a danger that London is missing what's happening in terms of the digital revolution, not in terms of the vibrancy of um, the, uh, the fintechs. Um, we have the largest community of, of fintechs, the largest community of developers. There are a lot of really, really good reasons to be optimistic. However, I am concerned that there is a level of ignorance about things digital, which pervades the city. Um, and there is a lack of understanding of what this is all about. We do seem to be in this country hugely confused about crypto assets um, and digital technologies, and they're not the same thing. No, no, and, I think that's a fair, fair comment and always, always worth making. Um, and so, 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 so my point I want to make here is that, that I see in what's happening in the EU and across Europe a much greater embracing at a regulatory and a statutory level of the new technologies. Now, maybe it's because we're blessed with a common law system in the UK, which allows us to do things without the need for statutory intervention. Uh, but it's not as simple as that. And I do worry that in terms of what we are able to introduce um, here in the UK, we are in some ways lagging what is taking place on, uh, 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 overseas. So it's a very specific point. This is not a one-way street that um, everything's, we, the world's open to us here in the UK and they're, they're all going to be tied up in bureaucracy in Europe. Uh, I don't think it's as simple as that. No, I, I'm certainly different. Um, we've reached a stage where I'm very happy to hear from anybody on, on what they've heard so far. Jeremy, you haven't spoken for a little while. What, what, what's your thinking on what we've been talking about? Well, I think, I mean, just briefly, the, the whole year of work from home that worked so seamlessly and the increase in, in digital trading, if you want to call it that, um, just points the direction that we're going to have to, um, that we're going to have to go. So yeah, I think there are going to have to be changes to the rules to allow us to do much more. Um, I mean, you're talking about all these new products and ways of development. I'm, I'd be very interested to hear what they are. We'll see what they are in the next few years. They're going to be huge opportunities. I mean, te technology, Fred, te I want to come to you next. Te technology obviously has the potential. We talk very loosely and vaguely about the word technology, but I think we know the kind of stuff we're talking about. Um, has the potential to er erode physical presence in some in some way. I mean, even in form, even in the form of this conference, you know, where you can have a speaker from anywhere in the world doesn't have to fly to London to be part of the conference. What's your thinking? So I think look, the Charlie scheme is an, is an important one. I think there's a, there's a very deep transition which is happening in our economies, and you see it in capital markets as well. Uh, you know, London, which has been known to be a, a center for you know, natural resources for the longest period of time, this year 50% of the capital that's been raised in our equity markets has been tech. 30% has been consumer. And the third largest sector is the green economy. So our capital markets, I think, are, are, are showing and displaying what's happening in underlying in, in, in society underneath. Uh, and look, the UK government has responded. The, the Lord Hill Review talks about a number of things uh, about making our capital raising environment uh, a lot more vibrant. Uh, the Khalifa Review on fintech has talked about making our environment a lot more vibrant in terms of digital markets. Uh, in the lead up to COP26, the UK government has put sustainable finance at the front of its agenda. And we're looking forward to the UK issuing its guilt. 
uh, and new technologies present you know a fantastic way to make what what is a really manual and tedious way of capital raising a lot more digital in the future. And, and you know, as one of the millennials on the panel, I certainly do think like, you know, four eye checks on swap term sheets and comparing them to bond term sheets is, is it's incredible that I've had 15 years in markets and, and we're still doing that. And that's a pain point that needs to be solved. So I think capital markets are a microcosm of change happening in society and is right. It's not about being unshackled. It's about seeing where the future is and both the UK and the EU are doing it. David. I'd, 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 I'd echo that. I'd say I'd still come back to the point of being nimble enough um, rather than debate um, with 27 individuals. Um, you basically have the freedom to be able to move forward and to move forward at pace. Um, I think some of those things um, are worth highlighting. You know, the Bank of England trying to, to lead the way basically in terms of greening out its corporate bond purchase program, for instance. But um, also um, the government getting ready to issue. I mean, yes, it's been a bit later, as um, Shea might have alluded to in terms of green, um, you know, targets. But um, it's at the forefront of the net zero um, debate and is, is really looking to, to press home that advantage of um, leading on that sustainable, um, you know, outlook, basically, as, as a center of finance. And so I think um, that, that really um, helps London and, and helps, helps the city, certainly, and um, will, will be worth, worth bearing in mind. Jerome, I'll come to you in one second, but David, just let me stick with you for a second also. Um, do, do you think that the, the UK government should, um, if you like, press the regulatory fiscal arbitrage button? Um, obviously, they, they, they could. Yeah, yeah. They could, they could you know, competition could be opened up in a fairly dramatic way. Should they do that? Um, I think, why not? Um, basically, they have that card. I mean, that's the whole purpose um, of gaining some of that um, control back. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily advocate for it to be pressed immediately, but ultimately that is the direction that we're taking. That is the path that we're on. I mean, there, there, there should be some distinction. There should be some advantages that you've gained out of that independence. And I think the ability to charter your own path is definitely important, and um, you know it's 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 coming within it's coming within the the, the remit, I think, both fiscally and um, on a monetary side, to be able to to separate yourself, I think, from from what it's been um, constrained by in in the last um, few years. And so, yes, I think it should um, right. within the reason of the agreement. Um, obviously, I'm not sort of trying to say they um throughout the agreement um, you know, immediately, certainly, um, you know, transition um, in, in a more sort of, what can I say, friendly um, manner. But um, I think that's a strong advantage and one that the, uh, the government should um, not be afraid um, to use um, in, 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 in its policies going forward. Okay, Jerome. Yeah, well, I think we are actually there are points of, of I think we're reaching a consensus to be honest uh, in this conversation because I, I do think that the um, the reality of, of uh, digital technology uh, means that we are going to be creating new products um, you know in the 70s we had uh, the, the, the uh, finance theory on the one hand and, and secondly computers which led to if you like the commoditization of a lot of financial products and with that came scalability and then the, the huge increase in the size of uh, what then became investment banks and all the, the oversight problems that came with that. And um, we're now, if you like, reversing that. We're going to, technology is going to enable all sorts of products and we can't even imagine what most, a lot of them are going to be doing. And so if we want to prepare and compete in that world, which I'm all in favour of, I'm all in favour of letting things out, but we have to realise, you know, we don't want to be the world's capital of money laundering and all sorts of other problems. We've got efforts to have a fiscal uh, regime covering much of the world. You know, we do have to, therefore, on, you know, rethink regulation and actually look not at instruments, not at the not at, not at those details, but at the details of who is participating. And that's what I was trying to say earlier. And these things, I think, are absolutely ingrained. And with that, hopefully we can have a much more competitive and much more innovative uh, market or set of markets. And I, I'm not saying that Europe won't do that, but I think our ability to to adapt and do that fast and be nimble 
uh, uh, is absolutely there, and we shouldn't miss that opportunity. Well, I, I know you're a keen student of efforts towards um, uh, CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. Yeah. The Bank of England has the opportunity to take a head start in that, and should, is your view, very quickly? Well, we have not enough time to really talk about this because no. um, obviously Mervyn King was a great favour of disintermediation of banks by extending QE and, and digital currencies, central bank digital currencies could really accelerate that on the one hand. And I can see that as a main way of trying to, uh, maybe in a tiered way, which is uh, what Carney is suggesting in his book, try and uh, at least reduce the systemic risk in the banking sector. However, it comes with the the warning that um, you then got a central bank, which knows uh, uh, got a lot more information, which is open to abuse. And at the moment, it, it, there is no proper oversight because it's independent. So bizarrely, I'm in favour of um, making the central bank unindependent again and have proper parliamentary oversight of what is effectively already a fiscal agency and is shortly potentially to become a much more powerful agency of monetary policy as well as it recaptures the ability to control the money supply. So there's a lot of issues in there, which we <laughs> haven't got time to cover. Uh, no, we have, we've got three, we've got just over three minutes. So um, uh, you by all means talk about central bank digital currency, um, Jeremy, but if you want to talk about something else, you've got a minute to yes. do it, so please. Yes, again, I, I was just thinking from, from sitting outside London, where most of our, our as, as buyers of bonds, where we do, um, the sort of importance of London is, is less important, whether we're buying you know, a Swedish bond from Sweden or... or, or a, a, but one, one of the things is that the, the, certainly the service we receive from London-based uh, banks is, is excellent. And you do have the sort of big six or seven banks who seem to have that advantage and they tend to want to sit in London. So I think there is that aspect of, of who's, who's supplying what and servicing. And I think we're talking about products a lot. I think service is something which is also extremely important um, and, and I think will remain uh, a very important part of financial, as we call it, services. And one shouldn't forget that it's not just uh, instruments and regulation that are there, but it is service as well, which is extremely important. Yes, well, one excellent service in, in Paris restaurants, doesn't one, Charlie? Um, Charlie, half a minute for you. Say what you want to say. <laughs> well, I just I just repeat again, I think in, in a key point, I don't think that people are taking... Uh, my friend Sir Peter Eslin is very has a very good phrase, which is about, talks, people talk about IQ, they talk about EQ, uh, but Pete, nobody is really talking about DQ. We have very low digital Q uh, amongst a lot of very important people in the city of London. And it's about time people started to embrace what's going to happen. This is not just about Bitcoin. This is not about XR, XRP. This is not about money laundering. This is about overhauling core infrastructure. You mentioned things like reducing settlement times. This is really boring stuff to a lot of people. It's not sexy, but it's incredibly important because it and will allow for the release of capital. It yeah. will uh, re allow for the reduction in counterparty risk. And it's not about crypto assets. It's about the mainstream bonds and even equities or whatever that we're dealing with. And we need to be very aware because if we're not careful, we will get left behind. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, plumbing is incredibly boring, but if your plumbing goes wrong, you certainly know about it. 100% uh, agree. Boring stuff is much more important. Now, we have 15 seconds for David and 15 seconds for Shrey. So, oh, David, you first. Oh. 15 seconds. Quick. Yeah, I, I'm, I'd say the tech is definitely the side that we should look at rather than the asset or the crypto assets. Um, as a millennial, I think I'd be doing my fellow millennials a disservice to say um, there's, there's nothing there in the digital currencies. And so I just keep it as simple as that. Um, the tech is, is definitely worth exploring. And um, I think we should. Yes, we are a bit old on this panel, apart from you and Shrey. Um, <laughs> give me. Uh, Shrey, you, you are last. Competitive, global, diverse, open. That's London's future. Oh, brilliant. And the clock hit zero just as you said it. That's a millennium for you. Hurrah for the London Stock Exchange. May it ever continue. Um, ladies and gentlemen out there, I'd ask you to applaud. Applaud if you like, sitting in your homes or your offices. But all of you on the panel, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you to the audience for questions. And now we move on 
was an interactive roundtable discussion on diversity and inclusion in the financial sector, chaired by Morgan Davis and Richard Kemish, which is due to start now. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.